time for gear tasting. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I thought I would start out and go through another bin. So this is my navigation bin. Um, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk about compasses because we haven't really addressed that much. Um, and I'm a big fan of compasses. I love using them, obviously, to find my way and navigate and things like that. But um, I really kind of geek out about some of the features and I always have a watch compass with me pretty much on every watch I wear all the time. So I started out with uh, some Sunto Clipper compasses and now I've kind of migrated over to the one that we teamed up with PDW for, but I first wanted to talk real quick before we, because I plan on giving you a view so you can see exactly what I'm talking about on a lot of this compass stuff, but first off I wanted to quickly discuss the difference between kind of a lens attic style compass and a base plate style compass. So hopefully many of you kind of know what the, the difference is between them, but I will first start off by saying when I meet a lot of people that have, don't have much experience with navigation, a lot of times they'll have a lens attic style compass, but it won't be the really good lens attic style compass the military makes. So there's a company called Kamenga, I think I'm pronouncing that right, but they make the, if you're going to go with a lens attic style compass, I would highly recommend this brand that you go with because in every surplus Army Navy store out there, you'll find a knockoff of these Kamenga compasses that are out there and I, I hope I'm saying that right. It doesn't sound right. C-A-M-M-E-N-G-A, -M -M -E Kamenga, anyway. So the knockoffs are super cheap, though they will let you down, they will break on you, and when you buy a compass, you should buy for quality because it really does matter when it comes to a compass. A compass losing its magnetism is not something to take lightly, um, or a compass that develops a big bubble in it so that you can't navigate with it. Those are huge issues that come up when you're looking at compasses. So I kind of go by the old adage, you know, buy cheap, buy twice. You don't want to buy cheap when you buy a compass. You want to buy something that's quality and that's good manufacturing to begin with. So that's my little spiel on compass quality. So back to the types of compasses. So this is the standard base plate compass. You're looking at a, a Sunto MC2. This is the global, no, this is the regular MC2 version. And it can be a little confusing looking at compasses too because there's a wide variety that a lot of different manufacturers make. So the reason I tend to shy away from lensatic style compasses nowadays is because base plate compasses, in my opinion, have eclipsed the features that traditional lensatic compasses give you. So when you're sighting and you're taking a bearing with either of these compasses, you are looking through the compass as well as reading the bearing that you're getting on the dial itself. So one thing that you do. So if I was going to hold this lensatic style compass and I was going to sight through it, I would adjust this top cover and adjust this piece here, which is basically a magnifying glass that allows you to not only look through the top or look through the center. Um, and with, a, with this style, you're not looking through the top, but this is, so I'm kind of stuck on that, obviously. But you're looking through this little tick mark, a little hole in the lensatic style compass and you're looking through this wire that's on the front cover, so the hole in the, the front cover. So that's kind of your, your, your guideline as you're sighting. But then you're also adjusting this so that you can see through that and then look through here at the same time without having to move your face. So with just a look of your eye, you can see the bearing you're trying to take as well as read the bearing that you're getting. So that's, this, that's the purpose of a lensatic style sighting compass like this. So, when base plate compasses came along, they integrated that same feature in them, just not a lot of people know how to use that feature. So, you know, this is also great for a signal mirror, but at the same time, what's great about this is you can use that same feature. So you can sight through this and then, you know, again, you know, as you're holding this up without moving anything more than your eye, you can read the bearing that the, that the dial is on too. So without getting too far down the rabbit hole of how to use a compass, those are just some of the great features on this too. And you can also sight uh, right through the, the bottom of this too. So you can sight through the top or you can sight through the bottom. Um, it's got a great, it, there's just great features about this that I really like, which is why I tend to prefer a base plate compass. Um, and the other is that you can get these with a magnetic needle. So if you're traveling in between the northern and southern hemisphere, the needle will work. Um, that is a, a downfall to some of the compasses. They don't have a, a a global option to them. So the Sunto MC2 does, which is, 
you know, again, I'm not here to push product on gear tasting, uh, but we do carry the Sunto compasses because I believe in them. Uh, I also highly recommend the Silver Rangers too. I've had really good luck with those too. Uh, but I found in my personal experience that Silvas have not held up the same way for me, in my personal opinion, uh, as the Suntos. I've, you know, this is what I run on my rig all the time. So, you know, I've got, I've always got a, a Sunto compass with me and it's one of the global compasses just because that's what I like to use. But um, I have this attached to my rig and I'm always using this out in the field. So I, I swear by Sunto compasses and it's, again, it's what I use, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But while we have this view, I just really wanted to illustrate the difference between the uh, lens attic and base plate style. So let's get into some more. Okay guys, now that I have stuff on the tabletop, what I wanted to point out is just kind of the, the scale of different compasses that are out there. So you can buy compasses that are literally this small, which to me is, is kind of a last ditch effort. I would never carry something this small, even in a survival kit. Um, you know, what we have in, in our survival kits just is a is kind of a smaller version of what I have basically in this wrist compass. So this is the compass that's in my survival kit. And this is, this is a pretty good compass. These are, you know, we select these for our survival kits because there's, there's only a really a couple of different companies that manufacture small compasses like this. Um, these, these are made by uh, Tokyo Compass out of Japan, and that's one of the premier manufacturers of small compasses like this. And these are, I believe, double A rated. I'd have to check. It's either double A AA or triple A. But the higher the A marking, the the better rated it is. So what you're going to find with a better compass that's even this size is that they're not going to develop bubbles and they're not going to get messed up. So that was actually something that that I researched as you know my I guess compass <laughs> history has gone. Um, just to show you a little example of what I've been through uh, with compasses, I can kind of co compare and contrast the differences here. So basically what happened a couple years ago, I actually wrote an article about this too, is that Sunto, this was my Sunto clipper compass that finally just kind of gave up the ghost. Um, it just, it stopped rotating a little bit inside. But I used to wear one of these on my watch all the time, and I still do. I, you know, Sunto is now making these again, but for a while they stopped making the clipper compasses. So I was like, oh crap, what am I going to do now? I got to find a new compass. So I kind of scoured eBay and some other manufacturers out there to try to find a replacement for it. And, you know, I, I started with these Brunton compasses and, you know, those developed bubbles. They were just kind of crappy as a whole. Um, I think I found a bulk pack of these guys on, um, eBay and you can see what's, you know, what happened to those. They, you know, completely fell apart and developed bubbles and things like that. A small bubble doesn't mean that the compass is bad sometimes either, um, but when the bubble starts affecting the ability for the dial to move freely, that's when you have a problem. So, you know, and you can see on the back of this, this, this one says China versus, you know, the Tokyo compass. And again, that TC with the Japan is, you know, a mark of quality when it comes to small compasses like this. It just, it is what it is. Um, one of the reasons I like the Sunto too is they're, they're made in Finland. They're not made overseas or anything like that, but um, there's also U.S. made compasses. I can't remember what Silva is as a whole, whether, where they're made. Um, and this isn't gonna, no, this is made in Finland too, so. Silva's and Suntos are both made in Finland from what I could tell. But so, you know, I mentioned earlier the Silva compass. This is a Silva that I've had. And I really like the size of this one because it's a great small compass for gear and a backup compass too. Uh, but it, you know, it doesn't have some of the features that the, you know, the larger Suntos have. But as a whole, I, I had a problem with the bubble that's in here on this particular, uh, this particular Silva. This is a Trekker Model 420. I don't even know if they make those anymore. Uh, but again, I've used Silver Rangers before and that's been a great compass too. And, you know, I'm not here to really specify a specific type of compass to buy, um, just more give you an overview of what's available. So at any rate, I, you know, I went through a lot of different, you know, small compasses. I don't even know the manufacturer of this one here, but, um, you know, that actually broke on the back and I struggled for a while, obviously, in trying to find a replacement for the Sunto Clippers. And then they came out with this one. So now they're making these today and this is what I 
you know, have on my G-Shocks and things like that. But uh, when it comes to like my NATO style watches, uh, you know, when PDW started making these, we kind of joined forces with them to produce kind of this black exclusive one to us. So what's great about these two is that this is a little glow ring inside of here too. And again, these, this is made with a very high quality compass as well but you can pop out the compass from the back if you have to replace it from the housing, which is great. You know, that's a limitation of some of these type of things is if the, you know, this is made out of anodized aluminum, so the housing is not going to fall apart on you like a piece of plastic will, but if the compass develops some type of issue, you can always replace that, which I like about this too. So, and then, you know, PDW came up with this great idea to where you can, hang on, this doesn't bear with me. You can take this too and insert it into their their housing here, just like so, and it fits in really nicely. And then you can girth hitch this around gear, you know, so you can actually hang this somewhere and use the compass that way too. So I thought that was a great innovation that they came up with on that. So at any anyway, they there's a lot of different options for smaller type compasses, you know, and I was saying that. The, this type of compass is kind of a last ditch effort. This is not something that I would count on for primary navigation. Um, and honestly, my primary navigation as a whole tends to, to be a GPS nowadays. So I use my 401, it's got a it's Garmin Fortrex 401. This is what I use for primary navigation because it's obviously got a GPS and then I'm using this constantly. Um, I've talked about this before and I still swear by this EOG wrist mount. It's, it's a great mount and uh, much better than what the Garmin comes with. So when I'm using that, I typically have a full-size base plate compass as a backup, and then in my survival kit, I've got one of these. So I really kind of try to cover my bases, and then, you know, I'm typically wearing a watch too, you know, and a watch, you know, has a, will have like a Sunto Clipper compass on it, more than likely, because I'm wearing a G-Shock. So that being said, that's how I kind of cover my bases. So you can see I've, I've not only got kind of a, a primary, you know, secondary and, you know, kind of a tertiary option, but also whatever four is. I don't know what four is. Not the next thing up from uh, tertiary. So I've got a quadiciary, quadiciary compass, whatever that is. Anyway, so that's kind of my, my spread of compass options that I have, you know, when I, you know, am carrying gear and things like that. But the other thing that's great about these base plate style compasses is they have they have a built-in protractor in them. So you've got a scale that's you know, built in for a one in 24,000 style map. So if you're familiar with military grid reference system and navigating that way, which I highly recommend, and I will link to in the video below in the description, a great article and ebook that we put out on how to do that. Uh, because it's just a, I swear by it, it's a, it's a great way to navigate and you can use it with any USGS one in 24,000 uh, scale map that's out there too. So, you know, the other part of navigation is your pace too, because pace is important. So, you know, pace count beads are something that I swear by and I always have on me too. I've tried other things through the years, like um, this for instance. I tried to, you know, wear a, an actual pace counter like this and it's loud and obtrusive and just really sucks. It's a pedometer and I'm not really a fan of that. I kind of wish with uh, a lot of the new gadgets that are around like Fitbits and you know the Apple Watch can now track your steps and things like that. I wish that was uh, super accurate and you could use that for a pace count. It's just not, in my opinion, it's not where it needs to be to, to truly measure pace like you can as you're actually counting steps and it's a pain in the butt, um, but it's, it's something you have to have to measure distance as you're navigating and we talk about that in the article too, so I won't get too far into that, just that you know, to say that I'll link you to that below. But so that kind of covers a lot of the, the compass stuff that I wanted to show too. And, you know, over the years, my compasses have changed, you know, what I carry. Um, you know, I used to carry this for a GPS, this little E-Trex Vista. Um, and this was bulky compared to the 401 and it does a lot more things than the, than the, uh, this Vista did when I was using it back in the day too. So um, it's really, it really just uh, depends on how you, how complicated you want to get with a compass. And I would say that no compass is super complicated. You're just, you just want something that's got the features that you need. And 
Um, in terms of a base plate compass, you really can't go wrong with the, the MC2 compasses from Sunto. And I swore by these little Sunto clipper compasses. I have broken one of them before. So, you know, obviously this is not meant to be something that lasts for years and years and years, uh, but it does do its job. And I do like that there's a little rotating bezel on here too. However, I really can't say that I've ever had to navigate with a compass like this um, on purpose. So this is another style too. This is a, um, if I remember correctly, the brand name on here, uh, something nine, I think. It's a M9, that's what it is. So also made in Finland, so from Sinto. This, you know, you can actually rotate this to, you know, do the old put the dog in the doghouse compass trick. But at the same time, it doesn't have any kind of markings for headings or anything like that. So that is that. All right, one last thing I wanted to go over is kind of how I put all this stuff into practice too. And, you know, I talked about what I carry, but um, within the pocket of this LBT chest rig, which I wear a lot when I'm at the range and things like that, that's kind of where I have all this stuff and put it into practice. So my compass, you know, again, I have one of those Suntos. It's girth hitched around the strap of the, the chest rig, so I've always got it attached, um, and I've always got this key if I need to tweak declination on the back of the compass, um, because these Suntos allow you to set that. Um, and then the height that my chest rig is at, I can get this up to, up to eye level to actually sight through it too, so that's important is to, if you're gonna dummy cord your compass like this, you need to make sure you can still sight with it at whatever distance it is. You know, and then, you know, additionally in this pocket I've got a pen and a pencil. Pencils are important when you're uh, marking maps and things like that. So I usually carry my map in one of these lock sack bags. And then I've always got a protractor and these, uh, I swear by these little map tool devices and we sell these in our little land nav thing, but you can pull the direction for travel and things like that with one of these protractors. If you're not familiar with that, again, that article I'm gonna to link to will tell you all about it if you're interested in learning how to use one of these and as well as navigating with the MGRS system. So that's kind of what I carry for uh, that. And then in here, I basically tuck my pace count beads into that strap. So I always have those if I need them as well. But, you know, like I said, with, with a lot of the technology that's come out with GPS is like on the you know Garmin 401. A lot of this stuff is just it's really great to know this kind of information if your GPS fails, but at the same time, if you carry some extra batteries and trust that you're buying good GPS to begin with, hopefully you won't have those problems. All right, welcome to Questions Over Coffee. The first question is from Crazy Ace Armory on Twitter. You mentioned that you liked one brand of moisture wicking shirts due to them not holding smell. What brand? Uh, so just as a little back uh, precursor to this, if you are familiar with the gear tasting episode where I talked about that type of thing, um, I'm not a big fan of like some of the Under Armour shirts I've had experience with holding stink. So some of the some of the moisture wicking, I think they're made out of polyester. I can't remember specifically, but what happens is even after you wash those kind of shirts, you still get scent in them. So you still get your body odor wrapped up in those shirts. Um, Rob mentioned that there was some that he has that don't have that. So maybe that's an odor problem from Under Armour stuff. So don't quote me on that. I'm not really sure. I haven't bought an Under Armour shirt in a long time. So um, that's that was just my previous experience with them. So that led me over to uh, look at dry fire shirts uh, because they marketed those as antimicrobial, can't say that word today, antimicrobial, and that they didn't hold stink. So I actually did a stink test and had Kelly sniff me for like seven days straight while wearing the shirt. Um, actually, it's quite a fun thing to do around my household, but uh, I put together a video of that, I'll link to that below. That was a couple years back, but I really didn't find that, uh, or I found that they lived up to their name. So even after washes and things like that, I didn't have any type of uh, stink retention inside the shirt too. And it was also great because it kept the stink down during the week I was wearing it too. So um, I actually wore that shirt to bed and all that good kind of stuff, but you'll hear all about that. All right, next question is from Terry on Facebook. 
Hey Brian, who shot first, Han or Greedo? And how about some questions over coffee on Ridiculous Dialogue? Really enjoyed the videos, podcasts, and your kick-ass gear. Thanks for your support, Terry. Appreciate it. So, as far as Han and Greedo goes, if you go back to when Lucas didn't screw up the Star Wars movies, you can actually see that Han was the only shooter. So, in my opinion, Han not only shot first, but was the only shooter uh, on the grassy knoll. But if you look at the special edition videos, you'll see that Greedo actually draws on him, and, you know, I guess that's... Uh, Lucas's way of saying that Han is not such a bad guy, he was just defending himself, but anyway, that's what I think of, and uh, questions over coffee and ridiculous dialogue, we could definitely do some questions on there. We're actually uh, thinking about some other podcasts to do too, so maybe have something like that in the works coming up. So if you guys are interested, we do have a ridiculous dialogue podcast if you've never heard of it, so that's kind of our witty banter that has nothing to do with the tactical side of what we do. We just sit around and bullshit about anything and everything. Uh, but the tactical and ITS tactical, that's what we like to say. But if you're looking to give it a shot, it's Ridiculous Dialogue. You can find it on iTunes. All right, before I get into the last question, today I'm drinking Spartan Coffee Brush Fire. A uh, little shop out of Texas we know and love. This is their dark roast. Brush Fire is a single origin coffee sourced ethically from Brazil's Pogodacadas region. I, I'm probably screwing that up, sorry. Roasted longer to bring out the smoky flavors and then rapidly cooled to produce a smooth and sweet lingering finish. Notes of smoked cedar, toasted pecans, and toffee. Spartan, bush fire. So, last question Matt asks from Facebook. Can you go over how to create and keep a dope book? Of course, be glad to. So, uh, dope stands for data on previous engagement. So, what you're doing is you're creating a record of basically what your gun is doing in regards to uh, your elevation, really. Um, wind is usually not logged in anything that has to do with dope other than noting wind in a particular day in a particular time uh, and where you're at. So if the wind was blowing really hard from the east at you know, 2 o'clock, um, it's worth noting, but then again, you know, winds change, things like that happen. So it's really just it's really taking a, a hard look at your elevation changes in your scope uh, based on what your bullet's doing. So uh, what I've done is that I've kind, of, I've kind of changed what I do over time, uh, and I haven't been shooting long range stuff for that long, but over the time span of how long I've been shooting, which is you know, now I think a little over a year uh, that I've been doing long range stuff, I have gone from you know, using a pretty big dope book like this, this is, this is actually one from uh, one MOA solution. So I was using this for a long time, but this is big and bulky. Uh, I love some of the, the stuff that Adam from one MOA solutions is integrated into this thing, but I found that I didn't need this big of a dope book to track stuff. So uh, what I did is I, I started using these range cards. These are from rifles only and they're printed on waterproof paper. And I just make sure that I'm using a, a waterproof pen like from right in the rain when I'm marking these but so these are kind of my range cards so as I'm you know shooting and engaging different targets at different distances um, I'm writing down you know what the actual adjustment that I have from zero so meaning that what I'm dialing in elevation is noted on this column uh, and then my range is here so really those are the keys for something on a dope book is you want to date you want to note the the time that you're shooting, you want to note the date, you want to note the location that you're shooting, um, and you'll probably want to note the DA or the uh, density altitude of where you're at because that will give you idea, an idea on what your dope is going to do at a specific density altitude. So when you go to a new location and you get the density altitude there, by can, you can get that by checking a, a Kestrel like this. But when you get that, then you can refer back to your dope book to say, oh, I'm in this density altitude, I know that my gun does this based on the bullet that I'm shooting. So this has been a great way for me to track that kind of stuff. And these are just a few of the ones that, I, that I've been using to, to track that type of stuff. But what I do is then go back and put this kind of information into the computer. I've got a, basically a spreadsheet that I created that tracks my dope this way too. And that's something the, that I can print out at home on a laser printer I have with some waterproof paper. And that's something I can keep with me if I'm, if I'm going to you know, a location to go shoot at. So. The great thing about these range cards too is that you know once I kind of know where I'm shooting and I can get my dope put down on what my gun's doing on these things, I can pop these into uh, this holder that Rifles only has. And I've, I've talked about this before in gear tasting, but what's great is I can keep a few of these cards in here and then 
this is like a slap bracelet. So as I'm shooting, I can reference my dope on my wrist, which is great because that's really what you need to be able to do anyway. You need to be able to look at uh, what your gun's going to do at different distances as you engage targets and know what dope you need to dial your gun into or what you need to put on your elevation to be able to hit the target. So another thing I've used in the past is the Knight's Bullet Flight app. I highly recommend that too. I think it's maybe 20 or 30 bucks to, to purchase, but what you can do is you can build a range card based on some specifics of, of what your gun's doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm still fairly new to this. And one of the questions that keeps coming up in my mind is, you know, where the change comes from. So I can run a range card like this and I actually find differences in what this is telling me, even based on, you know, putting in everything that's right on here. So I'll put in the pressure and the temperature and all that kind of stuff, uh, which obviously if you're looking at this, I didn't do for this. This was a quick range card I created. But as I'm looking even at Kestrel data that comes in, and this is the Kestrel with the applied ballistics, so this is giving me, you know, real-time uh, dope based on my gun profile and bullet profile. Um, I'm noticing differences in what I need to shoot. So I still haven't really figured out yet in my brain where that, that difference is coming from. So I, I would recommend um, that you do something like this because this is great for... These range cards like this are great for when you're shooting matches and things like that too because oftentimes you'll get, you know, you have a, you know, small IPSC at 288 yards and you'll get the range for that and then you'll, you'll get your stage briefing or something like that when you're about to go shoot and you'll have to note those ranges and, you know, you'll have to basically come up to the stage and shoot it and be correct. So once you have the ranges that you'll be shooting at, if those aren't, basically something you're gathering yourself through a rangefinder, you can then write your own windage adjustments, or sorry, elevation adjustments on here uh, based on your dope or your data on previous engagements, and you would have a really good idea of where to start at what to shoot that target at. So, you know, just, you know, remember, you know, the kind of the pre and post shot checklist, always dial your, your dope back down to zero uh, before you, you move the gun and things like that too, meaning if you're getting up and moving to a different stage or a different shooting location. Um, that way you know that where you're starting from. So hope that helps. Um, and I know that's kind of a lot of information on, on dope, but um, the other things that I wind up carrying with me on a regular basis other than this stuff, you know, is a good pen and pencil, my, my Kestrel meter, and then I always have a, you know, a physical calculator too, uh, just because I don't want to depend on my iPhone for calculations if I have to do, um, any kind of work like that too. So hope that helps. Hey guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Remember, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network. We will find your question and get it answered right here. If you're enjoying what we're doing here on Gear Tasting, please consider joining as a crew leader on our website. Details are below. Allow us to give you back something in return for your membership. Thanks for watching.